Hello and welcome to the Parted Podcast. Today we are talking about something that is actually pretty close to my heart. It's something that I've done with my motorcycles. A lot of you do constantly and I don't think anybody stops to think about why we do it. We are talking about modifying your motorcycles. Now, I know that as the motorcycles get larger, as you spend more money on your motorcycle, you feel like you need to do more stuff to modify your motorcycle. And I will give you good reasons why you should be doing that. But there are lots of terrible reasons why you should absolutely not be thinking about it as well. Okay, I've got some notes here so I can run this in some sort of structure, something I normally don't do for the podcast, so I will look down at the laptop here and there, don't mind me. Now, a lot of people will buy a motorcycle, for example, a 650 or a 700, and the first thing that they want to do is change the exhaust. But if you ask them why they're changing that exhaust, the answers, think about it, they're kind of silly, they're like, my friends do it, uh, my Ninja 650 would be cooler if it has an Akrapovich on it. Uh, or uh, they thought that it was needed and that the motorcycle would not be rideable if they didn't change the exhaust. And as soon as I say these things out loud to you, it should occur to you that that's kind of silly, right? Because what the manufacturer is selling you is a motorcycle that's ready to run. What you're supposed to do when you buy the bike is put petrol and go. And about a thousand kilometers later, you need to bring it back, get it serviced. And then usually you should be able to go for another 10,000 kilometers without any work being needed. So where did this idea come from? It's like buying a television and then having to do an IKEA job on it before it can show you a picture or make sounds. That's just not right. Now there is one good reason to modify a motorcycle and that is because motorcycles aren't designed to fit you exactly. The difference is, for example, buying a sofa from IKEA or Pepperfry or something like that versus getting a carpenter to come home, measure your space and create something that fits your requirements exactly. You can see what the difference is, right? So. Most of the manufacturers try and make motorcycles that fit as many people as humanly possible. That's both in role and in appeal. By role, I mean, uh, for example, TV has told us when we were testing the RTR 200 with the adjustable suspension, that 65 to 80 kilos is the weight range that they designed the stock suspension for. If you have adjustability in the suspension, then you can fine tune it further for your exact weight. Or if you're not between 65 and 80 kilos, you can use the adjustability to find a setting that is more optimum for your weight range. Similarly, a lot of manufacturers will also design the seat height, for example, of a motorcycle to fit as many human beings as possible. Which is why dirt bikes with say a 1000 mm seat height would probably be very good off-road, but there's no people who will be able to ride something that tall and therefore they stay to something more reasonable like 900 millimeters. But when you make a cruiser, you can't make a cruiser 900 mm tall because it doesn't do anything for the function of that motorcycle. It doesn't do anything for the appeal of the motorcycle. And the number of cruiser riders would be willing to ride a motorcycle with a saddle that tall would be zero. Okay. So functionally, the reason to modify your motorcycle is because you think that it does something which is not appropriate for how you want to use it and you'd like to modify it for specifically that purpose. In fact, that's how I modify my motorcycles. So when I bought my Ducati, when I bought my KTM, the reasons to modify the motorcycle all came from things I think the motorcycle could do better with a little bit of help from me or some equipment, right? So let's talk about the primary ways that we modify motorcycles. And most of it for me has to do with function, whether it is to modify the ergonomics of the motorcycle or it is for a purpose like touring or the racetrack or it's adding something simple like lights, which is a function of touring in some ways, but there are legal issues in there, right? So the first thing you need to remember about modifying your motorcycles is during the warranty period, most manufacturers will strenuously discourage you from modifying your motorcycle because chances are you lose your warranty over something like that. A lot of Indian manufacturers and the guys who import motorcycles into India are actually quite gracious about you modifying your motorcycles. And what they more or less say, it's an unwritten rule almost, is if they can't trace the fault that you're facing to a modification you did, they will generally not deny a warranty. But remember, this is not how it works all over the earth. There are many places where a warranty will be voided just because you modified your motorcycle. And the easiest thing that you can avoid is cutting and splicing any wires. This is especially true for current day motorcycles which are heavily electronic. There are CAN buses which rely on small voltage fluctuations to communicate with each other and splicing a wire can interrupt that process. And after that, you'll just have error after error and all of these errors technically will be traced back to the fact that you spliced or cut that wire and then your warranty gets voided, right? Let's talk about more specific things, for example, like ergonomics. Now, just to give you an example, uh, on my Ducati, I run serrated pegs from their off-road line uh, and I've removed the rubbers. In fact, it turns out that my KTM is also running Himalayan pegs rather than KTM pegs after I wore out the race pegs. The thing is, these modifications were done because I think that it fits my boot better, although I know that serrated pegs and race boots together are not a great combination. They'll probably wear out my boots faster. But I like the amount of grip that the foot pegs give me and that's why I do it. 
I also do it because I, both these motorcycles are out in the rain and in the wet in the mud quite a bit more than usual and that means getting additional grip from the foot peg increases my ability to ride these motorcycles. That's the only reason why I changed the foot pegs because otherwise the stock foot pegs were just fine. In fact, if anything, I used the Ducati so much that I actually started to wear out the stock aluminum foot pegs, at which point I found a great eBay deal and moved on to the steel off-road foot pegs rather than the aluminum ones that it comes with. But ergonomics, a lot of people immediately want to change the handlebar. But my question is, did you try rotating the handlebar? Because if the handlebar is like this and you rotate it down, it comes closer to you. Maybe that solves the problem and you don't really need a pair of risers or a completely new handlebar. Especially if your height falls into the median range of human heights, which is usually something like 5 foot 6 to about 6 foot. If you're in that height range, technically the manufacturer has done a lot of testing to ensure that that handlebar seat and footpeg combination does what that motorcycle's role is supposed to do. Is modifying it automatically. I got a set of rocks risers on my GS because my friend has rocks risers. That's not a great piece of logic and we'll come to how the money that you're spending on these things could be used for better things in just a bit. Okay. The other reason to modify them is for a role. Just to give you an example again, my KTM, the Ducati both operate quite a bit of their time out on the highway and highway means long hours in the saddle. But does that mean that I immediately need to upgrade my seat? It's something that actually I would put a lot of miles on before I discovered what was right for me. And remember, my solutions may not be your solutions. To give you an example, when I got my 390 Duke and I went back uh, down to the racetrack for the first time on it, it's a 3,500 kilometer round trip. Uh, at that point, we were going to Curry Motor Speedway. You know KTM seats almost feel like plywood when they're new. And going down to Curry Motor Speedway was quite a painful experience. And my first thought was if it's a hard seat, the foam is stiff, it's going to need time to wear in rather than I need to modify the seat right now. And surprise, the second time I went to the racetrack, about 5,000 kilometers after I bought the motorcycle, it became the best seat I've ever sat on. I've never had any butt aches at all on my KTM Duke, which is a surprising thing, especially if you think of what you hear online about the KTM Duke seat, right? The Ducati is the same. Ducati does offer a more comfortable, more expensive touring seat. So does Royal Enfield now for all of their motorcycles. But do you need that seat is something that I would not comment on for the first five to 8,000 kilometers until I figure out where the seat and my bum and where their relationship is at. Don't automatically spend money on equipment because a lot of the problems may not be coming from the equipment. It could just be technique. And we'll talk about that also. When it comes to touring, the usual modifications I see are people adding air cushions to the seats, uh, adding sheepskins, although that's uncommon in India, it's more common in colder countries. Uh, sheepskins are favored by around the world travelers, so clearly there is something there that we need to look at. A lot of people uh, take the fabric off and add gel inserts and all of that, and that's fine. If it solves a problem for you, that's awesome. But my question always first is, do I need to spend money on this problem, or is time going to solve this problem on its own and I can use that money for other things? Then comes the question of bikes that are being modified for the racetrack. So I see a lot of people who will buy a motorcycle and the first thing that they want to do is change it to race bodywork. Now the race bodywork idea was invented for two things. One, you get rid of all the extraneous weight like headlights and all that kind of wiring, the indicators, etc. And also race fairings are badly made compared to stock bodywork so they can be a little bit lighter. They are also cheap which means if you crash it and you wear out that piece of fiberglass or plastic, it's easy to replace it with a fresh set of race bodywork and carry on with your life. I understand that. But do you automatically need it on your first track day ever before you know that you're going to do track days regularly or not? To give you another example, I bought my R6 in 2017. Uh, it was completely stock. The chap had been riding it on the racetrack for 10 years and he basically removed the indicators. The headlight was taped over but was still very much on the motorcycle and PC, the original owner, is a very, very fast rider so he certainly could have modified it and got more performance out of it, performance he could have used. He's also not poor, which means that he could easily have afforded top of the line race bodywork if he wanted to. But the motorcycle remained stock because it was doing exactly what it needed to do. And it's true for the R6 today. So four or five years down the line, I've been riding it seven to eight times a year at the racetrack. And I feel no reason to spend money on race bodywork and stuff. If anything, I would probably spend money on suspension and tires, which would give me a lot more benefit than a set of plastics. Okay. The final question I'm talking about is lights, because lights is a question that we get quite often. Let's be clear. 
auxiliary lights in India are technically illegal unless they are covered in the daylight is how I am given to understand it. Which means if you have a pair of clear waters or Denali's or Baha designs on your motorcycle, you are required to physically cover them and close them off in the day. That's when they are legal and in the night when you uncover them, you can use them. The problem is they are not designed to not blind other users and therefore you are going to cause a problem for them and that's the reason why lights is con considered such a hot topic and why so many policemen, especially down in the south in Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, etc. are busy uh, taking motorcycles with lights off the road, breaking those lights, etc. and all of the drama is going on. But the fact of the matter is, if your lights are on in the night blinding other people and you're not dipping them or switching them off to, in, to give them convenience so that they can see where they're going, then you are in fact part of the problem. That said, lights are essential to touring as far as I'm concerned because they do allow you to see where you're going quite a bit better than the stock headlight, especially on lonely roads when there's no oncoming traffic. In oncoming traffic, some of them will be on high beam and you will be blinded by it. But the simple solution to that is to not look at the idiot, which is our normal reaction saying, ah, that idiot and your eyes go there. And then you're blinded for three or four seconds. I just look away. On roads that have the painted line on the side, it's called a fog line. I will generally focus on the fog line so that I have an alignment as to where my bike is going for those two or three seconds until that guy is passed. And honestly, I wouldn't even spend emotion on that. Okay. So for function, modifying a motorcycle, I understand and we'll talk about at the end in terms of what the logic for these modifications is. A lot of people though are modifying their motorcycles for performance and the usual category that they go to straight are exhaust ECUs and piggyback ECUs and all of this kind of thing. And yes, I get it that in European culture and American culture, exhaust ECUs and all of this is a very normal part of motorcycling. Although there are movements in Europe especially which might outlaw all of these things and you might be required to keep your bike as stock as possible for as long as possible. Remember that exhaust, especially loud exhausts are also a problem. In Austria, they've already banned one of the most popular motorcycle roads just because of the noise that the motorcyclists make on the average Sunday. This is going to get worse for all of us and it's something that we need to do something about. And the first thing you need to understand is you don't really need an exhaust. Now, back in the 70s and 80s, when technology was a little bit poorer, motorcycles were not tuned as well tuned as they are because of emissions and performance requirements, there could be a lot of gains from adding an exhaust. Okay, so it was not uncommon for you to say that, look, I bought the new GSX-R 750, I added an exhaust and I got 15 bhp extra out of it. That used to be because there was room, there was headroom in that engine to be able to extract more performance. That's no longer really the case. It's not like you're going to take a Panigale V4, which already makes it 220 bhp, add an exhaust and get 250 bhp out of it. What you're going to get is a little bit more torque here and there and a little bit more horsepower. And think about it, it's 220 horsepower already on one of the lightest motorcycles there is. What are you going to do with that extra 50 bhp apart from tell your friends about it? Why did you spend that money? That Accra will probably cost you, I don't know, 2 lakh rupees or 3 lakh rupees. Okay, let me put a statistic out there on a 20 litre motorcycle. Okay, if your motorcycle has a 20 litre tank, a lakh of rupees at today's prices is over 55 full tanks of gas. 55. Okay, let's assume that it's 50 full tanks of petrol. 50 full tanks of petrol into a range of 300 kilometers tell me how many kilometers that is in the comments. You could be going that kind of a distance for the money you spent on that exhaust, which increased performance in a part of the performance envelope of a motorcycle, which you probably will not use. And even if you go to the racetrack regularly, you'll use it maybe three or 4% of the time. Tell me that this was money well spent, right? I am going to say that Using horsepower is very difficult in any case, okay? My Tuono has 175 bhp and I promise you, no matter how hard I ride it, I will never use all 175 bhp more than, I don't know, 0.01% of the time. What I'm usually relying on is more torque. Torque is useful, torque is useful every day. In first gear, as you're getting out of your garage, as you're overtaking something and out on the highway in India where speeds are relatively slow. But the exhaust modify power, they don't really do that much for the torque, so why are you spending money here? What most people don't realize is that sprockets actually give you a bigger advantage than exhaust and they are a heck of a lot cheaper than the uh, exhaust. I don't know why you wouldn't do that. Okay. The reason why I recommend sprockets is because most motorcycles increasingly are given sprocketing that allows them to clear emissions while carrying as much performance as possible. Okay. And unfortunately, emissions is not measured across the entire rev range. It is measured at specific parts of the rev range. So the motorcycle needs to be more efficient and more quiet at those specific RPMs. And the exhausts are being tuned for that, which is why sometimes you have motorcycles that have obvious flat spots and you wonder how a prolific manufacturer like Honda, Ducati, Aprilia, whoever, are producing motorcycles that clearly have flat spots. It's not like they don't know better. It's just that they need to clear emissions and otherwise the motorcycle will be much weaker. 
but a sprocket can get you over that by placing your revs when you are riding normally just above or below a flat spot and giving you more performance. To give you an example again, uh, my Ducati's torque curve is famously lumpy. It's not like it lacks torque but the variation in torque is quite high at most of the RPMs that we would normally use to ride in India. That's I think 2,500 RPM to about 5,000 RPM. So the first thing that I did is change the rear sprocket to a plus 4. Now the calculation is simple and it gets confusing when you try to remember both. But just remember that more teeth on the rear is more acceleration. Okay. The opposite of that is less teeth on the front is more acceleration. Okay. Which is why I don't try to remember both. I just try to remember the rear and I derive the fact that the front will be the opposite. I did the same for the street triple as well. I don't feel the need to do it to my KTM because I think the KTM performance is actually well balanced in how I use it in the city and how I ride it out on the highway. On the Tuono also I added a plus two sprocket and the reason to do this is think about it like this. In Europe the average say street speed uh, is let's say 15 kmph faster than India and that means that the motorcycle on average is carrying let's say 700 rpm more than it carries in India on average. They are tuning it for Europe for most of these motorcycles which means if we were to be able to ride 700 rpm higher for whatever speeds we do, we would get a motorcycle that feels better to operate, has more torque and rolling on and accelerating past things becomes easier. That's exactly what the sprocket does and the best part is that sprockets and chains aren't expensive. A front sprocket will usually run you between 5 to 7000 rupees at maximum. Rear sprockets will be another 3000 rupees more than that again at the very maximum. And the most expensive chains except for that uh, uh, maintenance free diamond chain, most of those chains only run to about 18 to 20,000 rupees. And that's top line brands like DID or RK. Right? So in something like 35 to 40,000 rupees you can have a motorcycle that does significantly more usable performance although the actual curves haven't changed. Why would you spend a lakh and a half of rupees doing this? Right? Again, remember that sprockets do void your warranty, so be very careful when you do it. Uh, and most of the time, again, the manufacturers don't really, you know, raise a ruckus when you go to service with a chain sprocket. Many of the times the mechanics just aren't skilled enough even to tell that there is, especially a front sprocket has been changed. They will notice a difference in the performance and they will simply assume that you've got a rapid bike Evo or a power commander or something on it and, the, and they let go but you'll get a much nicer motorcycle out of it. In fact, I was surprised to note that in the case of the Ducati, my fuel economy actually went up significantly and that meant out on the highway, I was cruising at higher revs but I was enjoying quite a bit more fuel economy, my tank range increased and I could ride instead of, I don't know, 300 kilometers between fuel stops. The sprocketing allowed me to ride almost 340 kilometers between fuel stops and if you think about it, over a thousand kilometers that does save you almost an hour of time in stops, in fueling, etc, etc. Okay, so the third thing that most people do is weight reduction and weight reduction again in the 70s was very, very easy to do because the frames were so complicated and the technology, uh, computational fluid dynamics, etc was just not available. On today's motorcycles, getting rid of weight is a really, really hard thing to do without making the motorcycle wildly illegal. Right? So on a race bike, when you put race fairings on and take out the headlights and all, you might get 5-8 kilos out of it. But on a stock motorcycle going down the street like an EDV or something, losing a lot of weight is a really, really difficult challenge and or you have to throw a lot of money at the problem. Okay? Uh, to give you an example, you take a motorcycle and you want forged wheels on it. For example, on a KTM, a forged wheel or even on a KTM will run almost 80,000 rupees. There's no arguing with the benefits of a forged wheel. But remember that a 3 lakh rupee KTM may or may not be able to handle in terms of your wallet a 1 lakh rupee set of wheels. Right? Now in my KTM's case, I love that motorcycle and I want to keep it forever. And if you look at how much money has been spent cumulatively upgrading that motorcycle, it's probably a substantial amount. But most people don't want to keep their motorcycles forever, they're only in it for 3 or 4 years and then they want to upgrade. In that cycle, would you spend that kind of money knowing that when you sell off this motorcycle, you won't get it back. Okay, so weight reduction is a great idea and there's a better place to do it than the motorcycle but buying really expensive weight reduction gear like titanium bolts and stuff if you're going to ride around every day and ride, I don't know, weekend roads with your friends, it's kind of pointless, right? Finally, we come to the topic of aesthetics and the one thing that you want to modify a motorcycle for aesthetics is to raise your visibility levels. By visibility, I mean retro reflective elements on your motorcycle that basically return light as headlights fall on them so that other people can spot you because being visible is the biggest part of being safe out in the street. Nobody really wants to run over a motorcyclist but if they didn't see it, 
this motorcyclist, then you, they don't really have a choice about it. So adding reflectives to your motorcycle is a great idea and you should do it, it's quite cheap and if you do it tastefully, it actually improves the motorcycle by quite a bit. The usual things that we do are rim tapes uh, and you should get re reflective rim tapes rather than colourful rim tapes because then they add a function to it. And I generally recommend that we are used to seeing more vehicles from the front as white from the rear as red and on the sides as amber or white. Okay, this is in terms of how we, if you were to uh, be going down a road and you see a retro reflective element that looks white, you'll generally assume that it's coming towards you. If you see red, you'll generally assume it's going away from you. And I'm saying use these assumptions to your benefit by putting more red at the rear, more white at the front and amber or white on the sides. So you increase your visibility as well as give them one additional piece of information, which is whether they're looking at the front of your motorcycle or the rear of your motorcycle. So visibility modifications, they are a great idea idea for sure okay the other part is aesthetic requirements and that is a huge subjective area where how you want to do it and what you want to do it is up to you to give you an example of my Ducati again I bought it it was too red for me because at that point there was just no stickering no striping nothing at all and therefore I and my friend Zubin we sat together and designed uh, a pattern which uh, Balveer uh, our artist at that point helped us create and that basically reduced the redness of the motorcycle but my only reason was aesthetically the fact that it was that large and that red bothered me at that point of time but if it wasn't the case if that's not what I was thinking about would I really customize that motorcycle or wrap it or something I don't know that I would do this for the first three or four years I'm still learning to live with this motorcycle, learning to love this motorcycle and that's a time to figure out what it's doing rather than trying to make it do other things, okay? So let me come to what I have learned over the years from modifying my motorcycles in terms of quick things that you can use uh, for your experience with your motorcycle and the first thing I would say is that don't do modifications for the sake of modifications or because your friends are doing them, okay? If your friend is 6 foot 5 inches tall and he decides to modify his motorcycle to fit him better, I promise you adding the same equipment to your motorcycle is not necessarily going to improve your experience unless you are also six foot five okay so think about modifications as ways to improve your experience of a motorcycle so for example if you're out on tour and you realize that your luggage is always moving around and is causing problems that's a good reason to modify a motorcycle so that you can mount your luggage more securely will it make your motorcycle look cooler maybe not will it make your motorcycle lighter most likely not but will it improve your riding experience by a hell of a lot? Yes. Is this an expensive modification to make? Not always. Okay, most of my motorcycles have little nylon straps that stick out from under the seat, which form non-scratchy bungee points, which I have used with my normal luggage, which is a brand called Krieger, which I've used with bungee cords, which I've used with cargo nets. It requires almost nothing in terms of money. It is almost invisible on the motorcycle as you see it, but it serves a massive function to the point where it is almost the first thing I do when I buy a motorcycle, including for the Tuono, where Honestly, how much luggage are you going to carry on that motorcycle and how often are you going to do it, right? Similarly, think about modifications to the aesthetics of it, to the visibility of it, to the performance of it. From the perspective of what is the problem that you're going to try and solve? If you're buying a 200 bhp motorcycle, say the Street Fighter V4 that makes so much talk already, is adding more performance going to solve a problem for you? Or will the motorcycle be easier for ride if you actually reduce the power somehow, okay? So I'm not saying that there is a solution which works for everybody which will work for you automatically. Think about it. You are a specific human being with specific requirements, needs and tastes and your modifications need to talk to that, right? If you were to modify a motorcycle to be racetrack ready but you're only riding the weekend with your friends, what have you really gained? Right? So to me, modifications have a purpose, they have a solution that they present to a problem that you're having. It might not be a big problem, but I believe firmly that if you ride motorcycles enough, every small solution that you select adds value to your thing. I mean, we were doing product reviews here on Pardrift very recently and I brought out a whole bunch of socks. And uh, the product reviews had stuff like luggage and helmets and stuff and suddenly there's a pair of socks and Varun was like, socks, really? And ultimately we didn't really film the video, but I honestly believe that I have great socks that go under my motorcycle boots and that actually adds maybe 0.0001% of advantage when I'm out on a 14 hour ride. But it does an advantage and I will take advantage of it if I can, right? The second thing I would say is do modify stuff but modify your skills and modify your fitness. Modifying your fitness will change many things in your life. Right? Over the lockdown, I lost quite a bit of weight. I'm a lot fit now than I've ever been in my life. And I can immediately tell that doing my daily activity, riding the motorcycle, fast, slow, hard or long, in all these situations, just being fitter, 
just being stronger gives you a huge benefit okay motorcycle steering it opening the throttle doesn't require a lot of force but sitting on a motorcycle engaging your core and holding yourself steady does require a lot of force the fitness will change your riding experience and it's not really that hard to do either right i never went to a gym i didn't have a trainer so in my experience i sat on youtube and google and figured out a plan that seems to have worked the other thing i would say is modify your skills and that is essential that is essential because your skills are the difference between you having a great ride and you having a crash a lot of you are probably riding with your friends and riding on the weekend have learned riding from your uncle from your father and that's all awesome but remember none of these people have the full set of motorcycle skills and none of them have a way of assessing which of their habits are good habits and bad habits that's where so you need an external party to come and show you what you're up to and i would say go to a school uh, a school is an expensive investment i think uh, last time we calculated the two school would run you about 60 to 80000 rupees for the weekend that's cheaper than an exhaust but the stuff that you learn in the school applies to every single time you start the motorcycle and it improves every single facet of your motorcycling it's a fast far 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 better investment to me okay i only discovered the race track i'm going to say 12 or 13 years ago i discovered school no i think 16 years ago i discovered schools about 14 years ago and the way my riding has progressed before that and after that are just completely dramatically different from each other okay so to me if you are going to spend money modifying things modify your fitness and modify your skills your ability to ride a motorcycle and a huge part of that is time you spend on the motorcycle riding remember what i said about 1 lakh rupees being 50 tanks of gas i promise you even if you don't know anything about motorcycling by the time you get to finishing the 50th tank of petrol you will have learned a few things along the way the school will simply take away what is the bad things that you picked up and leave all the good things behind and give you more data on the good things and make you a better rider okay the final thing i want to leave this thought with you is that There was a time when there were great riders and the motorcycles weren't as great as their riders and so riders had a lot of uh, room to modify and improve their motorcycles to extract more from them but the world has changed since then the laws are tighter the penalties are bigger and the motorcycles are a hell of a lot faster i firmly believe that if it wasn't for traction control uh, stability programs etc the cars and motorcycles we are able to buy they simply wouldn't be this kind of powerful because they'd be just dangerous for you to operate from that perspective adding more performance to your motorcycle especially at the top end it's just a waste of money and time you're not going to be able to use the performance okay think about it like this let's say there are two race track riders who ride say the chennai circuit which is a small circuit and the bic which is a much larger circuit the guy on the bic does actually have an opportunity to hit over 300 kmph on the straight every single lap that he makes but if he were to take the same motorcycle to the chennai circuit his top speed might not even hit 200 on the back straight because it's just not long enough and therefore there's a 100 kmph worth of performance sitting there just getting wasted if he's at the wrong race track right so the advantage you gain on the straight of bic you could get a much bigger advantage at chennai by modifying your motorcycle to actually have a much lower top speed and a lot more acceleration that's what i'm saying in terms of thinking about modifications think about what will you do with this motorcycle and what mods will give you the biggest advantage from that rather than doing what your friends are doing or what's available on the market okay thank you so much for watching modifying motorcycles is getting to be an increasingly complicated topic because there's a lot of regulation especially outside india that is coming down quite hard on our ability to modify these motorcycles most of it is focused on the engines the exhaust and the ecus i am saying that sprockets are a far easier way to modify our motorcycles and get usable performance and i am saying do modify our motorcycles for a specific reason a reason that you think is important and that's the crucial part if you think the problem is solving then it's definitely worth solving thank you so much for watching this is the part of podcast we've talked about a lot of stuff about motorcycling and we'll continue to if you have a question that arises out of this podcast or any of the other episodes please do leave us a comment here or dm us on instagram we are at padrif we usually try and respond to all comments and all dms if we can we try and get you the best data that we can that's just how we work at padrif so don't feel shy leave us a question thank you so much for watching this is padrif my name is shumit and i'll come back to you soon with another idea of motorcycling on the padrif podcast until then bye bye